Walter, the stage is yours. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction. It's uh, lovely to be with you people. I'm delighted to uh, be with my Israeli libertarian friends. Uh, the way I beat Hayek is I said, look over there, and I grabbed his queen off the board, and then I beat him. I'm, I'm kidding, uh, but uh, I actually did beat Hayek at chess, and um, uh, I had a, a very good experience with him. Uh, he wrote a very nice introduction to my first book, Defending the Undefendable. Later on, I felt very badly because I did criticize his um, book, uh, Road to Serfdom, and I felt I was biting the hand that feed, fed me or something. But um, I, I welcome my students uh, disagreeing with me. And I think he was of the same uh, ilk. Uh, he, uh, I, I was never a formal student of his, but I was a student of his and I learned a lot from him. Um, so let me talk a little bit about libertarianism and maybe a little bit about Austrian economics. And then um, I think it'll be more fun to engage in dialogue and discussion with you guys. Well, what is libertarianism? Libertarianism, as far as I'm concerned, is a theory of what is just law. That's all it is. It doesn't say what's good or what's bad or what's moral or what's immoral. It just says, what should the law be? And the law should be that if you initiate violence or the threat thereof against innocent people, you should be made to pay a penalty. You should, um, uh, you should um, uh, be considered a criminal and have to pay uh, reparations or be punished. So that's sort of um, one foundation of libertarianism, the non-aggression principle. Uh, the other is private property rights, because we have to have private property rights, because suppose I go over to Galad now, I'm in New or uh, I'm not in New Orleans, <laughs> I'm in Vancouver, Canada, I go and I grab Galad's shirt. Am I a criminal? Well, I shouldn't have said Galad shirt. I should have said the shirt that Galad is wearing. Am I a criminal? Well, it all depends upon who is the rightful owner of that shirt. If he stole that shirt from me yesterday, uh, I'm just repossessing it. He's the bad guy. On the other hand, I never saw that shirt before. It's his shirt. If I grab it, I'm a criminal. But we have to have a theory of property rights in order to make the non-aggression principle work. And um, the theory of private property rights that I adhere to based on Murray Rothbard, pretty much everything I do in libertarianism and in Austrian economics is uh, based on Murray Rothbard. Not on the question of Israel. We'll get to that later. Uh, here, Murray and I disagree, but uh, on pretty much everything else. And um, uh, what Murray said is he harks back to John Locke, the philosopher, who says the way you get to own virgin land is by mixing your labor with it, doing something with it. Uh, I once studied with um, Rabbi Lipa Dubrovsky. Um, we just, uh, uh, he's a uh, Hasidic rabbi, a Lubavitcher. And I remember we did Baba Matsya, one of the tractates of. Um, uh, of the Talmud. And uh, very similar. Uh, what uh, Lippa and I did was compare um, uh, Talmud with libertarianism. And we found a lot of overlaps. It was just amazing and, and interesting. Uh, so I, I based it on um, John Locke, but um, the Talmud goes way further back in history than John Locke. And the Talmud is very similar. Namely, the way you get to own virgin territory is you mix your labor with it. And they had all sorts of combinations and permutations. Suppose you tell your servant to do this and uh, all sorts of complications. But the bottom line is that the way to get to own virgin territory is uh, by mixing your labor with it and doing something, uh, you know, cutting down a tree, planting a crop uh, and animals too, domesticating an animal. So we have the non-aggression principle and we have private property rights. And then how do you get to do the rest of uh, private property? Well, Robert Nozick wrote this book, Anarchy, State and Utopia. And what he said was um, any voluntary interaction after that. So let's say I homestead um, uh, land and I grow corn and, and you domesticate a cow and you have milk. And now we trade, we have barter. Well, now I own the milk, even though I didn't produce it. And you own the corn, even though you didn't produce that, because we can trace it back to homesteading and a voluntary interaction barter. Other um, voluntary legitimate interactions would be buying and selling and renting and, um, I don't know, gambling, whatever. So those are the two main elements of uh, libertarianism. And 
the way I, I see uh, the libertarian edifice is sort of like an Indian teepee, native Indian teepee, uh, long, long uh, sticks, uh, 20 foot long, and then they cross. And at the top, you, uh, right where they all cross, that's the non-aggression principle and, and um, uh, private property rights. And what's below that is the implications. Well, if you believe in non-aggression uh, and private property rights, well, what's our position on labor unions? What's our position on uh, drugs? What's our position on uh, prostitution? What's our position on uh, whatever? And um, our position as libertarians, I think, is that uh, as long as it's voluntary between consenting adults, uh, anything is uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate in the sense that it should be legal. It's not necessarily nice. Uh, for example, take prostitution. I, I, I don't go to prostitutes. I have a wife, a sister, a daughter, a mother. I wouldn't want them to be prostitutes. I don't think prostitution is a real great way to go. I, I'm more conservative than that. But the question, the only question for libertarianism is not, is prostitution a good idea or a bad idea? The only question is, are prostitutes violating the law? Should they go to jail? And the answer, I think, as long as it's between consenting adults is no, they're not violating the law. It's between consenting adults and they should not be considered criminals. And that's the only question libertarians ask, who should be a criminal? And the only answer they give is if you violate the non-aggression principle and, and um, private property rights. So I said that the, the edifice is sort of like a tent and the sticks cross and then uh, right where they cross is the non-aggression principle and private property rights. But what's above that? Well, what's above that is, um, well, how do we justify non-aggression principle? And uh, various people have various uh, ways of justifying non-aggression principle and private property rights. For example, Ayn Rand deduces it from A is A. Don't ask me how she does it. God bless her, but um, I don't follow it. Some religious people uh, say, well, God said, keep your mitts off of other people and their property. Well, that would be a justification. Um, uh, then there's natural rights. It's natural for human beings to be free. And uh, that would be a justification of uh, the non-aggression principle. My, my own favorite one is the one offered by Hans Hoppe, a friend of mine, a brilliant uh, libertarian theoretician. And he says, look, the only way to get to the truth about anything, let alone libertarian political philosophy, but anything is to discuss, to argue, to debate. Because if you don't allow people to debate and discuss and disagree, uh, how can you ever get to the truth? And Han says, well, what do we need in order to have a debate? Well, you'll never guess what. We need private property rights and the non-aggression principle. If you're going to have a debate, each person has to have a place to stand. That's private property. And nobody can, no debating partner could go to the other debating partner with a gun and say, unless you agree with me, I'll shoot you. That's not much of a debate. So I, I think uh, I'm a big fan of Hans's justification of the non-aggression principle. Well, I'm supposed to speak for about 20 minutes and I've already spent about 15 on libertarianism. So let me spend five minutes on my other favorite interest and that is Austrian economics. Well, Austrian economics has nothing to do with the country Austria any more than Chicago economics has to do with the city of Chicago. Uh, rather Austrian economics is named that because the people who started it all came from Austria. Um, uh, Menger, Hayek, um, um, Mises, um, um, all came from Austria, just like uh, the Chicago economics came from Milton Friedman and George Stigler. Okay, so Austrian economics got nothing to do with Austria, the country Austria. What then is it? Well, what it is, is um, the way I see it, and, and different Austrians and different libertarians will always disagree. The joke is, if you ask 10 libertarians a question, you'll get 11 answers, and uh, Austrian, there's a lot of debates among Austrians, but my view, the Rothbardian view of Austrianism is it all um, hinges on the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, oh, what the hell is it called? Synthetic a priori statements. So there are three kinds of statements. One statement is a tautology. Um, Bachelors are unmarried men. It's necessarily true, but it doesn't tell you about the world. It just tells you how we define uh, how we define bachelor, how we use language. And then there are empirical statements like it's raining outside. Well, that could be false, and you have to test it. The only way you can find out if it's raining outside is you know you look outside and, and you see, and it's an empirical statement, and it has a lot to do with the real world, but it's not necessarily true. So the issue is there, is there anything called the synthetic a priori statement, namely something is absolutely necessarily true 
and you can't test it and, and you can't falsify it and, and um, you can't uh, verify the truth of it by looking at anything. It's just a matter of pure logic. And Austrians of the Rothbardian variety say, yes, there is such a thing. Other Austrians said, uh, and, and Hayek would disagree with this. Mises and Rothbard uh, took that view and uh, Hayek and many other Austrians uh, uh, did not take that view. And I'm on the Mises um, uh, Rothbard side of this one. So what's an example? Well, one example is I bought this shirt for uh, 10 bucks and I don't know how much that is in shekels, but um, I, whatever in shekels is, I bought it for 10 bucks. And at the time, I valued it more than 10 bucks. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought it. Namely, Mises says the, the, the purpose of human action or what all human action is, is an attempt to make the future better than it otherwise would have been uh, had you not acted. And I think um, my future was better because I bought this shirt at 10 bucks. I valued it more than 10 bucks. So I made a profit. On the other hand, the guy who sold me this shirt, he had tons of them, and uh, he probably valued it at a dollar. He might have even valued it negative. He's taking up space. Let's say he valued it uh, two dollars. Well, he made an eight dollar profit off of me, and I valued it fifteen, so I made a five dollar profit off of him. And all of this is necessarily true, absolutely apodictically true. And we don't have to. We not only don't we not have to test it, we can't test it. No test that could falsify this. If you understand the English language, you understand that when people engage in any voluntary act, they do it because they think they'll be better off by doing. You guys are all now listening to me talk. What could you have been doing? Well, you could have been swimming, bicycling, eating, uh, sleeping, who knows, reading a book, what, whatever it is. Well, you decided ex ante that you were better off here. So you made a profit. And um, for Austrians, profit is a good thing. Uh, the, the Marxists would say when I bought the shirt, there was mutual exploitation, but you know that's just nonsense. Um, now, Austrians have a lot of views on a lot of other things, um, business cycle theory and, and uh, indifference and whole bunches of things. And uh, if you people are interested in that, we can get into that a little bit. But the, um, the essence, essence of it is um, uh, this uh, synthetic a priori statement. And because of that, Austrians are seen as, um, um, I don't know, uh, Goyim or something, or <laughs> not good guys, or, or cultists, actually. Uh, my PhD dissertation advisor, Gary Becker, a Nobel Prize winner called Austrianism a cult, as did Jim Buchanan, because they think it's not scientific. Because science is you have to test it and it has to be falsifiable and um, they're, they're po logical positives. Now, look, there are plenty of things in economics uh, that, that are not apodictic, that are not uh, synthetic a priori. Uh, for example, well, one of the things that is, is if you have a minimum wage law, it's going to create unemployment for unskilled workers whose productivity is below the level stipulated by the minimum wage. But we don't know how many people there are. That's an empirical issue. So we're, we're not against econometrics. We're not against mathematical economics. Uh, we, we just say that there are some, maybe a few statements in economics that are necessarily true, but not everything is necessarily true. For example, if you raise taxes, uh, we know that there'll be uh, less productivity, but by how much, we don't know. And, and you, if you're interested in that, you uh, do empirical work. Okay, well, it's now about 20 minutes, and I promised Galad that I would speak for roughly 20 minutes and then do 40 minutes Q&A discussions um, back and forth, and, and nobody should uh, threaten anyone to shoot anyone, otherwise we won't have a, a, good, uh, a good discussion. Uh, we, we'll, um, we'll adhere to the libertarian principles in our discussion. So, oh, uh, uh, yeah, what I suggest we do is that everyone that wants to ask a question, just unmute himself or herself, and ask the question, just make sure you unmute yourself after you do ask your question, because there are many people on this call, and if you don't do that, there's going to be a lot of uh, noise. So uh, just because I, uh, uh, I'm the host of this call, I'm going to uh, preserve the, the right to ask the first question and to make it as um, 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 maybe less theoretical and more something that's happening these days or the last year or so, in Israel, everyone that comes, that uh, flies to Israel in the airport is being tested by the test, by, by the state for COVID um, against his will, because no one really subject himself voluntarily to being tested usually, although some people don't have a problem with that. So my question is on principle, is it okay for the state to do that? And just to make it a lot more, uh, you know, principled because COVID is not necessarily that risky. 
but let's assume for the sake of argument that we're talking about a virus that is as infectious as COVID and as lethal as Ebola. So something truly horrible. Would you say that the state has a right, assuming we don't live in, an, um, in a stateless society, right? This is Israel, this is what we have. Does the state or have a right to test people? Okay, well, look, I'm a professor. I'm not supposed to ever answer questions directly. Uh, I do it circuitously. But before that, I have to say one thing about Israel. I'm a big fan of the uh, uh, two series that come from Israel. One is Shtisel, and the other is The Good Cop. And I'm a big, big fan of those two. And um, uh, I congratulate Israel for creating uh, that one, those wonderful shows. Well, and on also, behalf of Israel, I thank you. Also, Fauda. I, I love Fauda, the three uh, magnificent Israeli shows. Okay, um, on, on the COVID uh, issue and um, uh, more generally uh, uh, contagious diseases. Uh, I once wrote an article for the Journal of Libertarian Studies, and by the way, I'm not going to, I'm only going to give two or three minute answers, and if I don't give sufficient answers, if you want further, email me, and I'll give you like this article I wrote, uh, it's, you know, 30 page article, which I can summarize in two minutes, um, my email address is wblock, W-B-L-O-C-K, like around the block, at loino, L-O-Y-N-O, Lewis Oliver Yellow, New Orleans, dot E-D-U for education wblock at loino.edu. Okay, so I wrote this article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, which is my favorite uh, libertarian journal, and I attacked everybody. I attacked all libertarians, and I, de I, defined, I de divided libertarianism into two groups, hawks and doves. Who are the hawks? The hawks are people say, you got to get tested, you got to stay uh, six feet away, you got to wear a mask, you got to behave, you got to do this because... Um, uh, because the, the COVID or Ebola or whatever it is, is a horrible disease. It'll get us all. And, uh, and if you don't do that, um, you're violating the non-aggression principle. How are you doing that? You know, I once uh, went to a, a garden party and uh, there was this boy, 12 years old, and he was shooting arrows at a tree. It was a big tree and the arrows were not rubber tipped. These arrows were arrows where you go hunting to kill a deer, you, you take arrows like that. And I told the parents, you can't let him do that. What are you, crazy? Uh, suppose the arrow gets uh, into the next house and it kills somebody. And they said, well, it's a wide tree and uh, he's a good shot. I said, well, how would you like some other 12-year-old boy on the other side of the, the fence to be shooting an arrow in this direction at, the, at a thick tree there? And uh, happily, they stopped this. The point is that if COVID is like shooting an arrow at people, well, let me start again. There was this woman, Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary had typhoid. Typhoid is a very bad disease. Now, she wasn't a criminal because she lacked mens rea. She lacked a guilty conscience. She wasn't trying to infect people, but she was infecting people. Well, the right attitude uh, toward her is to stop her because she's um, shooting arrows or shooting bullets. I mean, look, if I go out in the street and start shooting bullets at random places, I'm a criminal. Even though I haven't hit anyone yet, I'm threatening everybody. Well, if um, uh, COVID is like that, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, you should quarantine or, or test it or whatever it is that uh, they want you to do. Now, uh, Gilad asked about the government. Should the government do this? Well, I'm an anarchist. I believe that um, government necessarily violates rights because it taxes people. Uh, but forget about that. Let me talk as a minarchist, the minimal government uh, libertarian, because if it wasn't the government doing it, should private defense agencies do that? Or, or to put it in the passive voice, should it be done? And if you believe, if you're a hawk, then you believe that yes, it should be done. On the other hand, there are the doves. The doves say, look, COVID schmovid. It's, uh, it only affects very old people who have a debilitating disease like uh, the cancer or obesity or something like that. And everybody should just do their thing and we should ignore this. Those are the doves. And what's my view? My view is uh, agnosticism. Because I believe as an economist in specialization and division of labor. We don't know qua libertarian. Now, look, if, if you're an epidemiologist and a libertarian, then you might know something as an epidemiologist or as a doctor, but not as a libertarian, because as a libertarian, all we know is what is just law. We don't know nothing about, uh, as we say in Brooklyn, we don't know nothing about um, the facts. So I think the proper attitude for um, 
for libertarians is to say, we don't know that libertarian theory has nothing to say about that. We can be modest about libertarian theory. Libertarian theory doesn't have to apply to everything. There are certain things that depend upon the facts. Is COVID uh, uh, contagious or is it not contagious? Well, if it's contagious and uh, then you're a hawk, well, then you have one view. If it's not contagious, you have another view. And we don't know whether it's contagious or not. So to, finally, to answer Gilad's question, qua libertarian, we don't know. And I say nothing because I'm a modest libertarian and I want to confine libertarianism to what libertarian specializes in, namely what's just law. And for just law, we have to know what the facts are. Um, um, Zach over here, uh, I'm going to pick on you because you're at the top of my screen, is now accused of murder. Uh, is Zach guilty or innocent? Well, as libertarians, we don't know because it depends upon the facts. Did Zach kill somebody or not? We can't say whether he's guilty or not without knowing the facts. And, and the facts are not a libertarian issue. The facts are, you know, objective issue. So that would be my answer to uh, Galad's uh, question. Uh, I suggest that everyone that wants to ask a question, just uh, unmute and, uh, and ask, ask away. It doesn't have to be a question. It could be an objection. It could be anything you guys feel comfortable with. First of all, I would like to say that I uh, humbly disagree with uh, Professor Block on what he just said, but uh, I would ask, I would actually like to ask a different uh, question. And, uh, but for even uh, before that, I would like to say that uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of uh, talking with Professor Block on uh, email. So I would uh, advise anyone to send him an email and send you a lot of uh, interesting articles and I had the pleasure. Um, so uh, as a fellow uh, libertarian and anarchist, uh, I, and I would like to ask you about your long uh, experience uh, of talking with uh, various people and uh, maybe trying to uh, sway people over to our side. What is your experience on that? And also uh, I've been thinking lately maybe to shift our focus from uh, actually convincing people to switch to our side to actually trying just to clarify to people that libertarians are just peaceful people uh, and they shouldn't have any justification to tax us, to hurt us, to, uh, to um, use the state against us, uh, basically. So what are your thoughts on uh, those uh, subjects? Okay, there's only one word that you said I wish you wouldn't have said. You used the H word, humble. We're all Jews. Nobody's humble here. So forget about humble. We're all, you know, we're, we're all uh, just talking um, uh, as equals. We're all, look, I've accomplished more than a lot of people. I'm 80 years old. Uh, I've had more time. I've been a libertarian since uh, 1964. 1965, maybe. Well, 64. Ayn Rand converted me to libertarianism. Uh, so I've, I've accomplished more than a lot of people uh, that are listening. I'm looking at you. You all look a lot younger than me. Uh, but uh, forget about humility. Nobody's humble here. Okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, change your question slightly. Um, uh, again, I'm never supposed to directly answer a question. I'm a professor. And, and the question I'll, I'll change it to is, well, what's the best way to promote liberty? What's the best way to promote libertarianism? And whenever I'm asked that question, I say, well, who are the people that have converted most people to libertarianism already? And the answer is clear. Ayn Rand for my generation and Ron Paul for you guys' generation. And maybe Milton Friedman uh, in third place uh, in terms of numbers of people converted to libertarianism. Now, um, Milton Friedman was a long way behind those two. And the only reason he was higher than Murray Rothbard or Mises, who I think uh, are better economists and better libertarians than him, is because he had a bigger megaphone. He won a Nobel Prize and he had a TV show. Uh, so let's forget about him and let's look at Ayn Rand and Ron Paul. Ayn Rand and Ron Paul are almost polar opposites. Ron Paul is a sweetie pie. If you've ever seen him speak, uh, he exudes niceness. It's disgusting how nice he is. He's just such a nice guy. You tell Ayn Rand she's a sweetie pie and she's going to smack you in the, in the head. She was not a sweetie pie. She had a different personality. Uh, uh, equally successful. I, I don't know who was better or whether it was equal, but they were both very successful. So from this lesson, my, my deduction is there's no one right way to promote liberty. 
And the way that you guys should promote liberty is whatever makes you most comfortable. Look, there are many ways to promote liberty. Um, Rand Paul and Ron Paul went into politics. And I think a lot might be going into politics uh, with the Zahoot party or his new party. That's one way. That's a good way. I once ran for um, a New York State Assemblyman in, in, in 1969. And I didn't win. But that, that's one way to go. Uh, Rand Paul and Ron Paul have done yeoman work as politicians. Another way is um, like what I'm doing, go get a PhD and uh, go um, uh, teach. And one of the things I'm very proud of and very delighted is about a dozen of my former undergraduate students are now professors of economics, and hopefully they're promoting liberty along the same lines that, that I do. Uh, other ways are the Mises Institute. I'm a big fan of the Mises Institute. I'm a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. There are other institutes like that. There, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, ICEPs in Israel and, and there are uh, JMS in, in Israel. There are two or three think tanks in Israel that promote liberty. There's Reason Foundation, Cato Institute in the US. Uh, every state has a, um, a think tank. In Louisiana, it's the Pelican Institute. So that's another way to go. Um, uh, there's the Free State Project in New York, in, um, in the US. Everyone should move to New Hampshire because it's a low populated place. All libertarians move to New Hampshire and then start voting um, libertarians in. Um, uh, Ayn Rand wrote a book, Atlas Shrugged. I mean, if somebody could write a novel or make a movie. Um, one of my favorite um, US uh, TV shows is uh, South Park uh, done by libertarians. Uh, so there are many, many ways to promote liberty. Uh, how, now to get closer to uh, Shelley's question, uh, how have I done it? Well, uh, by speaking, uh, I give speeches all over the place. I do interviews more now on Zoom than in person because of COVID. Um, I write books. Um, uh, Defending the Unoffendable, I think, is my most popular book. Um, I followed it up with Defending the Unoffendable 2. Defending the Unoffendable 3 is now uh, coming out soon. It's with the publisher, and I'm now working on Defending the Unoffendable 4. And I've done many other books and articles. Uh, so that's my way of promoting liberty. And I think that each of us should promote liberty in the way that they're most comfortable because it should be fun. And if it's not fun, I mean, if you have to do something you don't like, you're going to burn out, you're going to stop anyway. So do something that is fun. That would be the best way to promote liberty. Uh, next questions. Anyone? Yeah. yeah. Um... I want to ask uh, actually a very similar question. Uh, and actually, it's regarding uh, Austrian economics. Uh, me and uh, the previous person who talked, Lior, and another uh, guy named Amit, we run a Facebook page and we try to promote Austrian economics and proxyology in Hebrew to other Israelis. And I wanted to ask, like, uh, what do you think is the best way to, um, to get the general populace to to get into these issues and uh, really study economics, uh, even though at first it seems complicated and not really beneficial to the common person, let's say. Well, you know, in order to be an Austrian economist, you have to be an economist in the first place. And most people are not economists, so uh, we're not gonna have massive conversions. Uh, so I think there's a different way to promote, I mean, anyway, you can promote liberty with to anyone. I mean, because everyone is interested in, uh, in politics or e political economy or what the law should be. Uh, so the world is your oyster. You can convert, you have a, a, a target of seven and a half billion people to convert to libertarianism. We should convert everybody to libertarianism. But you can't convert everyone to Austrian economics because you first have to be an economist. So I think there's a different way of promoting um, Austrian economics and uh, among economists, and that is to write in, in the professional journals, the um, scholarly referee journal articles, um, uh, attacking uh, people who don't agree with us or trying to show that Austrian economics can better explain economic reality than alternative viewpoints. And um, uh, I've done quite a bit of that. I, I've written a lot of um, articles. I, I'm, I'm above 600 articles now. Not all of them are on Austrian economics. Actually, most of my stuff is on, on libertarian theory. But the, when I write on economics, uh, some of it I, I do, you know, um, you know what a Venn diagram is, two circles that uh, overlap. 
um, Austrian economics overlap with mainstream economics on a lot of things. Uh, there's no controversy there. But uh, on things where we disagree, uh, say the business cycle theory, they, they, uh, most of them are Keynesians. And um, you know there are right-wing Keynesians like Milton Friedman and then left-wing Keynesians like, um, I don't know, Keynes. And uh, one thing that Austrians do is to try to show that their views on the business cycle are wrong and our views are correct. Uh, there is methodology and, and, and it's an uphill battle for, for Austrians because they think of us as a cult as a religion, and they don't mean religion in a positive way. So it, it's a very hard, uh, it's sort of like the rock of Sisyphus, you push it up and it comes down. Uh, so it's very hard to convert economists in, uh, into Austrians, because they have a, a, um, a I don't know, um, a vested interest in the mainstream thing, because if, if they adopted Austrianism, they'd have to eschew a lot of what they've been taught. And by the way, I, Murray Rothbard converted me to the anarcho-capitalism in about five minutes while I'm exaggerating, but it took me a year or two to get through my stupid head that uh, the, the um, uh, praxeology, the um, synthetic a priori statement. 